Welcome to HBTV, the June 14th, 2021 edition. The background behind me is out of date. I used to live in the building that had this uh, view, but I left New York partly for political reasons and partly for weather reasons. So I'm now in Florida and I will uh, turn to our topic of discussion today which is pride, living virtue, not deadly sin. Pride, living virtue, not deadly sin. How do we approach a topic like this? The objectivist methodology is distinctive. Normally, if someone had a topic like this, you would expect them to wade in with, it's a virtue because blah, 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 blah. It's not a virtue. It's Look at what so-and-so said about pride or something. The objectivist theory of knowledge has a methodology, and the essence of it is to ask, what is it? To define your terms, to relate the things in reality that you're discussing, the subject and the predicate of what you're discussing. So the two things that we're discussing today is pride, and virtue. So let's begin by asking, what is pride? Pride, roughly, is self-value. Self-value. It's, it's a sense, I'm good. And it's a commitment to staying good and improving. Now, pride is used also for an emotion. It's used for the emotion you have when you do something you recognize as good. For instance, a child learns to tie his own shoes for the first time, and he beams. He's proud. He's proud of himself. Later on in school, as he develops, he gets an A on a difficult test. He's proud. He did it. I did it. Or in the larger adult world, Stefan Barcel. You know Stefan Barcel? He's the CEO of Moderna, who created the first messenger RNA vaccine that has saved so many hundreds of millions of lives, or tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions, a little over city until we get worldwide vaccination. Stefan Barcel must be proud. I don't, I can't prove that by an interview with him, but he ought to be proud. He has something to be pr prideful about, his achievement. So pride isn't the same thing as boastfulness, braggadocio, vanity, taking slight at the offenses of others. It's knowing not pretending, but knowing that you have done something good and that you did it by choice. As a character, character trait, it's the commitment to self-perfection. It's the view that I'm not only good today, as a being, I'm going to continue to be good. I'm going to improve. There are things I won't do because they're beneath me. The proud man would not lie. He would not stoop or lower himself to surrender the integrity of his truth to the distortions he might create in the consciousness of another person. He doesn't give other people's opinions that much influence on him. Things that other people do, he feels are not worthy of me. I wouldn't do that. I have pride. So pride is self-value and it has to be earned. It, like any other value, cannot just will it into existence. It's something you have to earn by your action. What is virtue? 
What is virtue? I don't mean what are the virtues. I mean, what is it about everything that's held to be a virtue that makes it a virtue rather than something else? Well, we are big on definitions. A definition is a genus and a differentia. Aristotle formulated the rules of proper definition, and they hold up today. The genus is the wider class of things to which the units you are defining belong, and the differentiate, differentia differentiates it from the other near relatives in that wider class. For instance, man is a rational animal. Animal is a genus, a wider class. You know, you're not talking about stars or lakes or mathematics. You're talking about animals. And man is the rational thinking animal. That's his distinction from the other animals in that genus. So when we come to virtue, what is the genus? It's a way of acting. It's a chosen policy of action. But it's a chosen policy of action, not for your health or for making money in the market. Nothing wrong with those things or, or, or for keeping your apartment clean. It's a chosen policy of action that's required by morality. It's the right way of action that you seek to institutionalize in your character. Well, right way, morality, what is that? Oh, it's all opinion, right? No. There's an objective fact that gives rise to the need for morality, and Ayn Rand is the first to define it. But before we get to that, what is it supposed to be? What is morality in general, whether it's the objectivist morality or some other code? It's a code of values to guide your choices and actions. The code of values, of goals, of things to go after that serve an ultimate value, an end in itself, which is your whole purpose of being. The breakthrough that Ayn Rand achieved in regard to morality was identifying what is that ultimate value? What is that end in itself that gives rise to the need to have any actions, to have any goals, to have any values? It's the fact that you are a living being and can go out of existence. There's only one fact that demands action, one value that has to be kept if you want to stay in existence, and that's your life. If you're going to live, you need to know what kind of things you have to achieve in order to promote your survival, your remaining in existence, long term, long range, because there are things you can do that will serve you for the moment, but will lead to your death in seconds, days, or years. And the survival that morality exists to serve includes not only your physical remaining in existence, but your mind remaining in existence, your psychology, your soul, your values. Now, there's no mystical soul, but Ayn Rand uses the term soul to mean a mind and its basic values. So you have not just a need for food, shelter, and clothing. You have a need for friendship, art, love, entertainment, you have needs for things that refuel your motivation and your consciousness because your consciousness is your means of survival. And that takes us to the final uh, preparatory point to answer the question of is pride a virtue? So, so far, just to recap, we've got pride, not the emotion, but the trait is the right way of acting that you institutionalize in your character. 
What makes it right is that it's the way required by morality, i.e. the way required for your optimal survival, long range survival, happy survival, motivated survival, full survival. And the basic means was included in that definition definition of man. Man is a rational animal. You know, man is a rational animal does not say man is the only animal with the faculty of reason. I think he is, although people argue about certain chimpanzees, but I think he is. What it says is he's the only animal whose ecological niche, to use that jargon, is thinking reasoning. Man is the animal whose means of survival is the use of his mind to gain knowledge, figure things out, and guide his action accordingly. So man's basic means of survival is the use of his mind. The next step is to realize you don't have to use your mind meaning it isn't pre-fated. It isn't done for you by your brain. Your brain does not pump reason the way your heart pumps blood. And I want to quote from Atlas Shrugged, the climactic speech by the hero on this very topic. Quote, man's mind is his basic tool of survival. Life is given to him, survival is not. To remain alive, he must think. But to think is an act of choice, the key to what you so recklessly call human nature. The open secret you live with, yet dread to name, is the fact that man is a being of volitional consciousness. The function of your stomach, lungs, or heart is automatic. The function of your mind is not. Close quote from Atlas Shrug. So reason is man's means of survival, but he doesn't have to use it. Only if he expects to live does he have to use it. He can turn off his mind and uh, either vegetate or follow others and let their minds do his thinking for him. And we see where that leads today in all the tribal politics, uh, the slaughter of the Tsitsi, is it Tutsu, Tutsu by the, hit, I can't remember the two tribes, the horrific slaughter that occurred in uh, that region um, about 15 years ago. 94. What? 94. The Hutu 94. God, time flies. So it's people can seek substitute for their own thinking. They can join the herd and stampede off any cliff. They can obey an authority and subordinate their thinking to his wh wh who's value they have no way of knowing and historically it's been horrible the leaders as we'll see in a minute the only thinking that you can control and know you're making logical and check for correctness is your own so the basic choice behind all your other choices is the choice of thinking versus non-thinking or that worse form of non-thinking, which is evasion, where you don't merely relax and veg out on the couch. You push knowledge out of your mind. No, it can't be true. I won't let it be true. I won't let it in on the premise that ignorance is bliss. Well, it isn't. Ignorance is death. Knowledge is what man needs in order to survive, and reason is his only means of getting it. Now, not everything in your mind is free will, is volitional. You automatize things. Like if I say Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers probably comes to your mind. That's automatized. You didn't have to turn a brain cell to get that. 
But if I ask you, what is the most important point of the points I've made in the last 10 or 15 minutes, you would have to pause, try and go back over what I've said, decide what the standard of it, you'd have to do a lot of work, right? Hell, even if I asked you, what did you have for dinner on uh, Friday? You probably have to do a little searching. If I ask you what you had for lunch a year ago on this date, it's hopeless. You can't, you're going to have to consult records. So there are observably mental processes like the Peter Piper picked a peck up where stuff just comes to mind. And there are mental processes that take you to drive them. And that's the difference between the automatized mental processes and the volitional, conscious, hand-driven mental processes. Automated, automatized material has an incredibly important role to play. If you, if you didn't have any automatized knowledge, you'd always be one day old. You would learn, you would retain nothing that you learned. So the stored memories that come that you can call up or that get themselves called up are incredibly important. And, and when something happens too fast for you to figure it out, something's flying at your face and you duck, it's your automatized learning that's behind that. And if you had to figure it out, you'd be dead by now. So automatization is nothing to sneer at. It's fantastic, but it, it does not relieve you of the responsibility of new thinking. Not if you want to survive, not if you want to be happy. So now we can put all this together. What is pride? It's a commitment as a character trait, it's a commitment, an automatized uh, commitment, which requires reinforcement to do the right thing. And what is virtue? the policy of doing the right thing. So it's not even a one step connection. Your commitment to pride is your commitment to morality. That's why Aristotle described pride as the crown of the virtues. It means the commitment to practice the other virtues. It's the commitment to earn your own self-respect. You see, because you're a being of self-made soul, self-made psychology, as Ayn Rand put it, it's very important to be in charge of the kind of person you become. Everybody becomes a certain person by habituating certain ways of action, but it's important to consciously take control of that process and shape your soul in the image of the person you want to be, that you think is right, that comport with your standards of the good. Hopefully those are pro-life standards. So to say it's a living virtue, it's the essence of all living virtue. Pride is the commitment to life. I value myself and I intend to keep myself in existence and live my life to the fullest because I value me. That's pride. So let's turn now to deadly sin. Unless there's a, a question I should be taking, Nikos, at this point. I have a general question about why pride from the ancient times it has been viewed so negatively and in greek uh, we had the term hubris which basically means being overestimating yourself and there are all these yeah. legends the legend of ficarus who flew too high now someone like jordan peterson would say look if everyone throughout history have a story about how something is going to destroy you you probably should be very careful with this something so what would be your take on this negative like yeah, hubris hubris is not pride megalopsokia megalopsokia is the greek for that aristotle's term a greatness of soul uh is pride and he also talks about self-love 
uh, that hubris is, uh, Aristotle actually talks about that. Hubris is overestimating what you deserve, what you have earned. Uh, you know, Muhammad Ali said, I am the greatest, but he turned out to be the greatest. I was just reading about uh, um, Schwarzenegger, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, someone who knew, well, I guess it was a friend of mine. He told a friend of mine before he was famous, he said, I'm going into acting. He was a bodybuilder at that time. I'm going to be the most famous actor in the world. And he was up there. You know, he was definitely, and then he decided to go in politics and became governor of California, where he was much less of a success. But uh, that's because he didn't first go into philosophy and get that right. And it's, it's said of Schwarzenegger that he learned how to learn. So he went into fields not knowing anything about them, but he learned how to learn that field. And that's what enabled him to be successful. Uh, so anyway uh if you think you're great or you tell yourself you're great when you're not then you got the modern american self-esteem through praise movement that doesn't work that doesn't work your teachers oh johnny what a wonderful thing you you got all these answers in a way we like to think of as incorrect in our culture but you are made a tremendous effort you get a gold star you can't gain self-esteem or pride by other people pretending that you've achieved something when you haven't. You have to earn it. So hubris is thinking, I'm omnipotent. I can do anything. I can, uh, you know, uh, square the circle. I don't know what it is. There's nobody to top me. I am. It's an overweening, exaggerated sense of your self-value. Pride, Aristotle said, the other side is humility. Oh, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. The, the golden mean, which is a doctrine that's not so hot, that he uh, had for his virtues is pride is having the right amount of self-praise. It's having the right amount, right estimation of your abilities, your morality, that which is true and which you can validate, verify. But if you pretend you're better than you are, that's not pride, that's hubris. And that's what the legends go after. But, but all these legends are neurotic. And, and Jordan Peterson, I don't know that he takes account of that, right? There are, there are all kinds of legends put out by bad, sick people to bring down good people. And the uh, hubris uh, things are often hubris legends like Icarus are often used to keep people small, to hold them down. And uh, there are a lot of things like that where um, a legend is, is created uh, to persuade people so of something that is emotionally important but evil. Um, like King Midas, uh, I think it's Cre uh, Cre Cretan or Croesus. Uh, it's in your neck of the woods, Nikos. Yeah, King so Midas they, so they, loved they, gold that everything he touched turned to gold. He got he got his wish. Everything turned to gold, and then he touched his beloved daughter, and she turned to gold. And he was punished for loving money. Well, there's some excuse for that back when money was made by conquest. But not today. And I don't think that was the motive. I think the motive was just pure rotten resentment of uh, resentiment, French, of, of envy, hatred of the successful for being successful when I'm such a loser. There's many, uh, you know, the Australians have the saying, you've got to cut down the tall poppies. Anyone who achieves more than his brothers is a threat to them by comparison. So there's an anti-greatness, anti-pride strain in all cultures because there are bad people in all cultures. That's free will. Nothing guarantees you're going to be one of the good guys. And let's turn to one of the evil guys. Today, 
when people think of Christianity, they think of the mild, watered down, kindler, gentler uh, religion that has been hollowed out by the progress of science and civilization. But real religion, real religion is an ugly, evil, irrational thing. And I give you in testimony, Pope Innocent III writing in just about 1200 AD when Catholicism was called Catholicism because it was universal in Europe. There were, there were no competitors. There were no atheists who were at least alive or speaking. It was everybody held this view. And so the church was free to bear its fangs. So I'm going to read to you on the misery of man by Pope Innocent III, a few things from it. What then is man, if not mud and ashes? This is why he turns to God with these words. Remember that thou hast made me of clay, and with thou and wilt thou turn me to dust again. God in turn says to man, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Man is made of mud and ashes. Why are you proud, O mud? Wherefore art thou exalted? What are you, O ash, that you should boast? Let us now consider the food. Going ahead a page. Let us now consider the food that nourishes the child in his mother's womb. It is evident that the embryo is fed by the menstrual blood. This is why women stop menstruating after having conceived the child. This subject, the menstrual blood, is said to be so detestable and impure that it makes trees barren and vineyards unproductive. It can kill grass, and if a dog eats of it, rabies results. You didn't know that, did you? Sexual intercourse is always infected, even in matrimony, with the desire of the flesh, with the heat of lust, and with the foul stench of wantonness. Because of this, the union of the sexes itself is contaminated. Whence, too, does the soul inherit the infection of sin, the corruption of evil, the filth of, the, of iniquity? Any liquid becomes corrupt if it is poured into a corrupted vessel. Happy are they who die before birth, who experience death before tasting life. Oh, the vile ignobility of human existence. Oh, the ignoble condition of human vileness. Consider the grasses and the trees. Out of their substance, they produce flowers, leaves, and fruit. But man brings forth lice eggs, lice, and stomach worms. They yield oil, wine, and balsam, whereas man spews forth sputum, urine, and excrement. They breathe forth a sweet odor, but man is redolent of an abominable stink. Uh, I mean, it goes on and on and on in that vein. Hatred for man. Why are you proud, O oh mud? That is the voice of the anti-life um, viewpoint, the opposite of objectivism. The pride is a deadly sin. And I like to quote Nietzsche, who's a, a very mixed philosopher that has quite bad views in epistemology and metaphysics revolting views but he's good against our common enemy christianity he says from the outset christianity spelt life loathing itself 
life loathing itself. And that is the essence of the whole unleashed Christian theology, not the way, the way it has mild itself down and it appears in today's uh, world. So you see the really, it, is, it comes into focus with pride. There's the lovers of life and the admirers of man versus happy are they who are born before taste, uh, who die in birth before tasting life. The haters of man, the belief that everything is dirty, abominable stenches and evil that's concerned with this life and with you versus those who do let's end on a, on a more positive before i take questions here is another quote from atlas shrug a climactic quote within the climax fight for the value of your person fight for the virtue of your pride fight for the essence of that which is man for his sovereign rational mind Fight with the radiant certainty and the absolute rectitude of knowing that yours is the morality of life and that yours is the battle for any achievement, any value, any grandeur, any goodness, any joy that has ever existed on this earth. Close quote. Pretty stark. You have to make your choice. It's not possible to make a compromise well man smells okay but he is morally corrupt you can't you can't uh, separate out your position on man's goodness and admirableness and possibilities in life from the whole religious view versus the Ayn Rand view objectivist view so I will stop my basic presentation at that point, and we can look at questions or comments that you have, Razi, uh, Nikos, or Razi. Yes, yeah, so we have, uh, just to remind uh, our viewers, so our priority is to super chats, but those of you who are members of Ayn Rand Center, you can send your questions in advance. I gather these questions, I collect them, and we ask them to Harry whenever there is time. So don't worry, at some point, your questions are going to be asked. Up to this point, actually, till last week, every single question had been answered. So before we go to the Super Chats, Harry, so what about the Tower of Babel? So do you see this also as Christianity saying, don't aim too high because you, you're you going to crash? Yeah, but I think, isn't that pre-Christian? Yeah, the Tower of Babel is uh, arrogance. It's challenging God. They built a tower so high that it reached to the heavens in the legend and God punished them for this rather than saying, Hey, come on up. What took you so long? Glad to see you. I made you in my image, you know, and it's great to see you the way a parents would a kid. Imagine the kid learns to stand upright and you smack him. What are you doing? Standing upright. You continue to crawl on all fours. Upright is for me. The joke is, that the way you can see it's neurotic, in the serious psychological sense of neurotic, it being the religious fables, is what is ascribed to God? What is the character and psychology that's described of God? Here's an omnipotent being who can say, let there be light and the sun appears. And he is the most touchy, petty, petulant approval seeker that you could imagine. It's obviously a projection of the psychology of the people who created God. So if you don't, if you say, um, thanks God uh, for uh, helping my parents create me, that was really wonderful. Now I'm going to uh, live and do great things. And I'm, I'm going to ignore you. No, you go to church and praise me. Get down on your knees. Tell me how wonderful I am. Or you will go to hell and be persecuted and tormented. How long? 10,000 years? No, not enough. 100, no, forever. 
forever. That's how important it is to me that you tell me I'm good. Because maybe I'm not. I mean, God is such an inferiority complex. A, co a confident man, and God is projected from human characteristic. There's no other way to do it. A confident man doesn't go around like Ed Koch, who was a good mayor of New York, saying, how am I doing? How am I doing? He knows how he's doing. You know, he knows he's good. He's embodied goodness, supposedly. Yet if somebody dares question him or not bow before him and not keep his arbitrary commandments, not place God first, they're going to suffer torment forever. And uh, I decided when I was 15 that if there were a God or is a God, He'd want us to live as atheists. He would have made us the way our parents made us, to become independent, functioning adults, happy. He wouldn't want us to go around crawling on all knees saying, I am nothing. Would you want your child to kneel before you? Oh, Father, I am nothing. You are everything. I am sinful. I am ugly. I have an abominable stench that comes out of me. But you... You, Father, are the epitome of all goodness and beauty and truth, and I cannot do anything but just obey whatever you say. If you tell me to, like God told uh, Jacob to kill, was it uh, Abraham to kill uh, Jacob? I forget the names of these. Mis he says, okay, sure. And then God says, wait a minute, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just, or Job. I mean, the, the, the stories are so disgusting. God decides, you know, let's test Job. He claims he believes in me, but I don't know he really believes in me. Of course, I can see into people's souls, so I know, but how do I really know? I'm going to send him all kinds of afflictions, and let's see if he then believes in me. And Job remains a believer. And so he says, okay, you did good. I mean, what kind of sicko would torture someone to get them to say, I still love you? It's, it's neurosis is too mild a term for it. Um, and uh, all the religions, well, in a way, the Indian religion, I'm told, is better and worse. But I was going to say all the all the Western religions have this image of, oh, you must obey and reverence and worship God. The first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. So commandment number one, listen to me and don't think for yourself. Obey me. Now, what kind of person says that? Ayn Rand never said that. She said, think it over. I've given you some input. I was just listening to her say this the other day on a tape. The right policy is for you to go home and think for yourself and decide whether the reasons I've given you are sufficient or not. And if you don't think they are, come back and I'll try to give you more. So uh, it's respect for the mind or hatred for the mind. That's what religion comes down to. Um, I did want to- a great uh, segment uh, in terms of what is the morality of religion. So let's go to Super Chats. Uh, they're not related to the topic, but they're good questions. Well, let me, let me make one other comment on the topic that I, I should cover is that you have to really work at what I said earlier to separate bragging, boastfulness, vanity from real pride. The proud man is not terribly concerned with what other people think of him. If you read The Fountainhead, that's the theme of The Fountainhead, right? In, in the second scene, someone says to the hero about what he's doing or an attitude he, he has, but that's monstrous. And the hero, who is this is rock of Gibraltar of pride, says, is it? That's his only reply. He's not phased by it. He, he just thinks, where do you come off thinking that? So uh, if you want to know what non-boastful but sublime pride is, read The Fountainhead if you haven't already. 
Okay, so we go to questions. We have a hard stop in 19 minutes. So if we don't cover your question, it's going to go to the, how it's called, the backlog of questions that we're going to ask in a different, uh, in a different session. So first question by Michael. Was Plato almost as evil as Kant? No. But if Kant I think, relied on Plato, why not? Um, now, these judgments are not uh, part of the study of philosophy. They're kind of side issues of who was a hero. And who, uh, naturally, you root for certain people. And it's important to judge, but it's, it's not an intellectual issue within philosophy the character of the philosophers. Um, but it's a valid topic outside philosophy, and I'll give you my thoughts. Plato is evil. Why do I say that? Because I've read the parts of Plato that they skip over when you study Plato, and they're in the Republic, but they're also in the laws, his last work. But in the Republic, he says, what will, he has Socrates say, what will be the uh, situation of doctors in your ideal state, in the Republic that you envision? And Socrates says, that, well, we won't have them because if a person's going to get well, he'll get well. And if a, he's not going to get well, he'll die and cease burdening the state with his body. Then the question comes up, what about uh, those who are impious? Now remember, Plato loved Socrates, and that's Socrates who's speaking. Socrates was killed for the sin of impiety. Plato says, well, in the ideal republic, if a person speaks against the, and it's not the religion, but the 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 world of the philosophers the the regime let's call it the regime the whole setup if he speaks ag against that he will be taken by the warriors to the night council the night council will try him and put him in a special education facility, you know, a re-education center. He invented the concentration camp, Plato. There he will be instructed on his, the era of his ways for a considerable period of time and then released. If he persists in stating falsehoods, you know, things I don't agree with, believe, he will be put to death. Now, Many of you out there in HBTV land have read in college Plato's Republic. I venture to say not one of you, unless you studied under an objectivist, read that part, uh, either part about the physicians or about the uh, impious. It's right there. It's right there in the book. Some translators try and water it down. Um, I have the... Uh, I think it's the Guthrie trans translation, uh, which features a, a good, strong, you know, put to death, a good, strong statement. But, so, but none of them can really whitewash that out. So Plato and, and his whole system is um, we hire people, see truths that you lowly people can't. So the good for you is just to obey us. The whole of Republic is to answer the question, what is justice? And the final answer, which you probably did learn, is justice is when each segment of society is doing its part. So the uh, farmers and tradesmen, I don't think he considers tradesmen, um, but let's say farmers and tradesmen are farming and trading and not presuming to have any say in the government or to be warriors. The warriors are taking their uh, orders from the philosopher king and not presuming to step out of their role. And the philosopher king is in charge of everybody. So Soviet Russia is justice embodied. It's, it's a collectivistic 
um, uh, each part of society functions for the good of society, which is to be under the absolute dictatorship of Plato, the philosopher king. Did you know that Plato actually tried to become a philosopher king? He went to Syracuse. He had a student, Dion II, who was the son of the king of Syracuse, and the elder king died. And uh, Dion sent for Plato. But the people wouldn't obey him, and Plato had to flee for his life. And that's a contradiction in the whole Platonic system a system which I could talk about, but Kant, now Kant. So Plato is like this frustrated intellectual who just said, God, if I ran things, people are so stupid. The masses are stupid. I should run things. I know what's right and what's good. Kant is much worse than that. Kant says you must sacrifice for the sake of sacrifice. He did advocate a, a, a statist system contrary to the whitewashing that's been done of him. His political philosophy is not the enlightenment typical thing you read, uh, but that's beside the point. He says that uh, you can't know anything for certain. You must just do your duty because it's your duty. So it's like Nazis. You must obey not the person of the Fuhrer, that would, that comes away, but the moral law, which you feel. You must obey the dictates of duty within you. And here's how you feel it. There are things you want to do, right? But you think aren't right. Do what you think is right and stop yourself from doing what you want to do. As a matter of fact, never do what you want to do because that's a sure sign that you're acting from inclination, not duty. The only thing that has more worth is you do it without any reason to do it, without any personal reason, without any gain for yourself, just because it says thou shalt. And his idea of what thou shalt was altruism, you know, serve others the um he has it's interesting he's so tricky he has a phrase for the categorical imperative in version two um treat mankind as an end in itself not as a means and ayn rand says the same thing man is an end in himself not the means but what kant means by that slogan is your purpose is to serve mankind you have no personal, your personal, you have plenty of personal motives and those are things you must stifle to be a slave to mankind. Uh, now that kind and, and also Plato loved reason and he didn't get it right, but he came, uh, you know, a couple of steps in the way that Aristotle then completed um, doing much more work than Plato had, but he got a few things right in epistemology. And he, he, he was in favor of reason and concepts. Kant, Kant's major work is entitled Critique of Pure Reason. You can't be purely rational. You don't know reality. Your mind is not competent. His you know, introduction to famous statement, I found I had to deny reason to make room for faith. Now, this is what you're bringing in Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson needs to recognize the automa automatized. So the voice of duty and the source of all these legends is not, as Peterson as a union thinks, some inherited tendency or inherited mental content. It's early childhood choices. So when your mother dins into you, don't think of yourself. Do what's right, even if it hurts. You are not put on this earth just to serve yourself. Share with others. You are just lucky to have more than they, and you should share with them and give of yourself. That's what's noble. Just being for you is being nothing. When she told you that 10,000 different times, if you didn't challenge it, 
It gets hab habituated into your brain. And then later is no, yeah, I hear the voice of duty. It's your mother's voice. That's what you're hearing. It's not some archetype implanted in the brain by evolution. It's your mother. And probably now you have a better view of your mother than you did when you were two and automatized the, well, I guess that would be more like three, four or five, automatize these conclusions. So we have something like six questions and eight okay, minutes. Okay, let's move on. I'll answer quicker. Okay, so I'll, a, a relevant question to you, to this one. Uh, would you say Ayn Rand was a greater philosopher than Aristotle? Can't, can't determine that. Can't okay. determine that. It's so like, is the guy who invented the wheel better a better inventor than uh, Steve Jobs? It, it's too incommensurable. You couldn't have Ayn Rand without Aristotle. I can't say that. I would gladly say that she is the best philosopher other than Aristotle. There's no one who comes close. There are a couple of other good guys, like John Locke, in the history of philosophy, but they don't, they're only th three, four top rung, totally revolutionary philosophers. And that's Plato, Aristotle, Kant, and Ayn Rand. Others so are very important, Descartes's very important, but he's not as systematic and all embracing as Plato or Kant or Aristotle or Ayn Rand. So another question, you mentioned most philosophers are neurotic. How could such brilliant minds come to the malevolent views of existence and of themselves? Well, you know, I'm not sure they're so brilliant. Do you, uh, when I was talking about in another show that most philosophers are neurotic, and they tell me this themselves. It was a philosopher who observed that. Uh, I wasn't talking about the great philosophers in history. I was talking about the people in academic philosophic departments today in the 20th and 21st century. In history, um, Kant was severely neurotic. Kant developed a fear of moonlight and have to have his bedroom window boarded up so that the moonlight wouldn't touch him. Then a little later, he developed a morbid fear of not getting moonlight, and he had to have the boards removed. It was either Kant or Hegel who was so afraid, I think it was Hegel, was so afraid of his students that he carried a revolver in his pocket to every lecture. Uh, Russell, uh, Wittgenstein tried to commit suicide. Or let's let us say he climbed a tree, threatening to jump off and commit suicide. Bertrand Russell talked him down, alas. Uh, but some of them, uh, you know, I don't think Descartes was particularly neurotic. Um, John Locke, I think, was very healthy. Um, Francis Bacon, I don't know about, but he was such a good guy. I'm sure he had to have a lot of self-esteem and would not be neurotic. Aristotle was magnificent. He his wife when he thought he was giving her a massage. So particularly many new left philosophers, they're, they were eccentric to say the least. Well, and Althusser you know, was actually you know, hospitalized and stuff. I take, a, I take a leaf from Woody Allen. You know, uh, Woody Allen makes a big jokes about how life is uh, horrible. I wouldn't join any club that would have me as a member. He's quoting Groucho Marx there. But, you know, the character he plays is very neurotic, very frightened, very despondent, malevolent, expecting the worst. And uh, I think that's a lot of intellectuals are like that. And they would have to be because they believe that the mind, their minds are impotent. And that you can't be morally perfect. In fact, you can't even get to the good side of things. So they're very life, you know, life's a bitch and then you die. I don't feel that way. So uh, I, I think it's the content of modern philosophy that has really made people neurotic. Sartre, God, there's a sicko. 
Okay, some more questions. Uh, we need to speed up even more. So, uh, Michael, I don't have time to go through all the questions. Okay, very quickly. So, uh, what makes, sorry, oh, I missed the order. Uh, is the reason plants don't feel anything because they're stationary? Animals feel only pleasure and pain because they move through space while man feel please, pain, happiness, and sadness because we move through space and time. I don't get that, but animals also move through time. Anyway, let's the, the first part. Yeah, is no, the no. reason plants don't feel anything because yes. they're stationary? Well, you could put it that way. There would be no survival advantage if one of them developed whatever mutation confers the beginnings of consciousness. It would have no survival value. Yes, there's a, a good book I can recommend, although it's kind of woozy reading, The Phenomenon of Life by Hans Jonas, who's a phenomenologist, but he writes on that uh, a topic about life and how motion creates consciousness. That is, you need, the consciousness enters when there's motion, and then the uh, higher forms of consciousness enter as the motion becomes oriented towards more distant goals, more remote goals in space and in time. So yes, you're right. Okay, uh, two minutes, three questions. So do most intellectuals today want us to suffer and live in squalor? Oh, absolutely. Consciously, they want us to suffer. Yes, they think that's the good. I mean, why did they praise the American Indian? I mean, there was there were people who lived in squalor and suffered. Uh, suffering is proof of virtue. So if you if you want to be virtuous, you've got to suffer. Kant, that's Kant's whole coup, a whole negative achievement. Which brings so, us to another question, which is why was Kant's philosophy so convincing to intellectuals? That's a great question, and the short answer is. He had a tricky set of pseudo arguments that no one was able to answer until Ayn Rand. I can give you the, um, the essential one, and you can see if you can answer it. Uh, we only perceive reality as it is processed by our senses, not as it really is. We only can conceive reality as it is processed by our human concepts, not the way it really is. So we live inside our minds and never get out to reality because there's no such thing as uh, the naive realist thought of a just unobstructed, clear vision. Your vision goes through your eyes. You know, you the image in the back of the eyes is upside down. And they, there's a cross of the nerves at the optic chiasm. So you see what you see is on the left is the retinal image on the right and vice versa. And it, it's all blurry and your system works with that and figures it out. That's not the right way to put it. So the sensory apparatus is interpreting reality, not just presenting it straight. That is a completely fallacious argument that was not answered until Ayn Rand. Okay. And last question, it has to be very quickly because we're already at time. So it's a question from Azad. What makes Kantian metaphysics and epistemology come at an anti-life approach in ethics? The motivation was the same. He said, I have to deny reason to make room for faith. He was raised as a pietist Christian and he wanted to update Christian ethics to make it even purer. So it was his motive. The motive for both are the same. Right. So again, metaphysics and epistemology need, needs leads to bad ethics in a way. Okay. So thanks so much to our super chatters. Next week, we are going to have a, an extra guest. We're going to have Don Watkins with us. And with Harry, they're going to discuss inequality. So that's going to be HBTV number five. Now, many thanks to those of you who showed up. Extra thank you to those who asked questions. I'm sorry we, we don't have time for Harry to go through the questions more in more detail. Maybe at some point we have a session only for questions or some of these questions Harry come back 
to them. That'd and also great. a big thank you to the Ayn Rand Institute that supports this series and brings Harry to our screens. So, Harry, thank you very much. And thank you, Nikos, for producing it and to the Ayn Rand Center of UK for publicizing it. Yeah. Thanks to Razi for being behind everything that you see in Ayn Rand Center UK. And see you all next week. Bye-bye. All right.